Hello and a warm welcome to everyone. My name is Oliver Elbert. I'm the Managing Director of Siemens Advanta Middle East, and I'm your host for today's panel discussion on Society 5.0, the big social transformation. But before we're diving into the discussion, I think it's worthwhile to spend a few words on the broader meaning of Society 5.0. It's a concept which was first proposed about five years ago, and let me try to summarize it really in just a few words. It aims to describe a new societal model which emerges from the information society and also from the impact the fourth industrial revolution will have on us. So in essence, Society 5.0 envisioned to be a much more human-centered society than before and aims to balance economic development with the various social challenges created by technology progress. So to just name a few particularly technologies which we are seeing to be central to digital transformation programs, be it big data, AI, robotics, IoT, and the like. So now when we zoom a bit more into the Middle East region, we actually see such digital transformation programs are already in full swing, from oil fields to manufacturing, but also really just the city infrastructure in general. So therefore, leaders in the region are already very much tackling the challenges of this major transition and addressing very important questions like how to cooperate better across companies and ecosystems, how to build the more resilient operations, how to break down organizational silos, and in general, how to best embrace innovation and adopt technology with an ever increasing pace. But now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our esteemed speakers to discuss their perspectives on how they are embracing technologies and the challenges they see ahead. So I'm very excited to welcome Nitan Chopra, the Group Chief Technology Officer of Dubai Holding, where he's responsible for driving innovation for the entire holding and also other fundamental topics like customer experience, operational excellence, and cultural change. Ahmed Alam, the Head of Strategy of the Red Sea Development Company, in charge of the strategy and realization of the technology vision for one of the most exciting giga projects in Saudi Arabia. Abdullah Balushi from the Zubair Corporation in Oman. He's a trusted advisor to the board of directors and is overseeing a comprehensive digital transformation program for the entire group, which will be a key stepping stone to the future of the Zubair Corporation. And last but not least, Khaled Abalushi. Vice President of Digital Projects and Innovation in ADNOC, where he has the exciting role of steering the digital transformation journey for all of ADNOC companies. So let us start with ADNOC, Khaled. In my understanding, ADNOC's vision is to continuously evolve as the technology leader in oil and gas. So ADNOC does not only acquire the latest technology, For the industry. So what steps do you see as most critical to achieve these objectives? Thank you, Dr. Oliver, for first of all inviting me in this panel and to be with the great hosts uh, and uh, to share our thoughts with the, with, the, with the leaders of various industries. So uh, back in 2016, uh, ADNOC realized that uh, we are losing a lot of opportunities by continuing to operate in the same conventional national oil company you know, perspective. So that's why um, uh, the leadership decided that ADNOC needs to challenge itself and relaunch the company to unleash the full potential. And hence, uh, it was the launch of our 2030 strategy, an essential element in, uh, in uh, part of that strategy was the technology piece and, and the technology ambitions. Uh, technology today is part of our business transformation program and is essential element to, to reach to our 2030 goal. Uh, I can tell you today, we, we, in ADNOC, we, we strongly believe that we cannot reach to our 2030 targets without, without the technology. And uh, 
and the management uh, support you know in, in this transformation and uh, was essential to drive the change and uh, to 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 uh, ad hoc leaders had to play a critical role in to support the technology agenda and uh, continue to support a drive you know this from a top management team so it's more of top down approach to to ease you know the 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 change and and so on and and to make sure that the strategies are implemented across the globe as you are aware adnoc is consistent of 14 operating companies who used to operate as as a different silos so bringing them all in under one umbrella one vision and trying to to drive this transformation you need a lot of that management engagement and, and support so mm -hmm. uh, for us technology is, is not a side activity anymore so in fact it is fully understood by the company and we are trying to make sure that everyone in this company and adnoc understands that we cannot deliver our business strategies without accelerating the transformation and technology agenda at all and uh, and uh, if you if you allow me to add an, a second element to, for for this yeah for, for this success i think is is uh, we we need to move that ownership from the management level to to the employees make them own this program and make them uh, lead so engaging them in the ideations the oppor uh, opportunity opportunity identification and so on so that you can balance the top down and, and bottom up approach together so they feel these are their ideas are being implemented and being driven and so on. And the third element for, for, for the success is really, for, from my perspective, is, 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 uh, is the partnership with, uh, with the leading uh, partners and academia to, to stay at the uh, forefront of innovation. And to make sure that through this partnership, we are solving real business challenges and, and conti continuously reprioritize our portfolio uh, based on the opportunities available in the market. Mm -hmm. So that for me, the three elements for, for success is really management support, people engagement, and the partnership. Okay. It's very interesting. So, so maybe building on that now, um, can you maybe share some insights of how Adnoc is enabling its workforce, its employees, in, in light of such fundamental and very fast developments of the entire organization? Yeah, I, uh, th thank you, Dr. Oliver. I think it's the, the the people part, enabling people, is is a big topic. And and if I if I tell you that I have a magic stick that uh, that uh, creates that engagement, uh, this magic uh, stick does not exist. Uh, so what we did, what we did, and I can share what, what you know our initiative is. We started the uh, you know uh, 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 a group-wide digital awareness program, an upskilling program. So to make everyone aware of what, what are these technologies, to make sure that they don't fear it. Because the moment they fear these technologies, if they don't understand it, they will push back. So we started the, what you call a digital 101 or a general awareness program, uh, going to the sites, uh, launching webinars, uh, you know, talking about success stories and how, how you know, this is driving uh, value elsewhere in the organization. So you take a success story from this side of the organization to the other side, excite them, engage them, make them uh, to, to, live it, to, to live it. And as I highlighted in, in, in the first question, uh, we, and then you engage them after, after they are aware, you, you engage them by, by talking to them, what are your challenges and, and take them into a design thinking approach, you know, how technology can help you to solve these challenges and what is it is it a process problem is it a technological problem or sometimes you know it's a simple uh, up, uh, training you, you need just a simple training on your existing tools you don't need to you know embrace new technologies and so on so no. it is it is a combination but to me to me really to drive this change and to enable these employees you need to educate them and you need to upscale their, their skills okay I see. Thank you. That's very interesting. So, may, so maybe one, one, one last question actually in, in that direction also is, so this, this concept of low manning, demanning, unmanning of operations is obviously so, something which has gaining enormous popularity in the industry, really beginning from offshore fields to greenfield mostly to really to then onshore brownfield operations. I think uh, Atmog is also very much a, like a front runner in that, in that regard. So thinking about this is the complexity of such a transformation of such a field, 
what do you think are the most important enablers there? Okay, so so you know, brownfield and greenfield are two different games. So uh, is 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 not one strategy that can be applied applied to both. So at Adnok, you know, we have a lot of our marginal fields uh, that we we the smaller fields. We started to uh, test these concepts on those fields and start digitizing them. And and main, the main driver was to reduce our cost of operation. And many of these fields are maybe sometimes scattered, so it's not practical to have huge operational costs to move from one side to the other side mm -hmm. and so on. So this was, the, the business was a primary driver for us to go and unman these facilities and and uh, digitize them as much as, as possible. And and sometimes we, when we say that maybe unman, sometimes we also refer as the reduced man. So it's not necessarily completely unman. And so to take that success on those marginal fields uh, we started uh, working on on the mega projects. So we have we have uh, two two mega projects uh, that are we are setting a good example in the industry: Hail and Russia development and uh, Buruj Four. So these are the two projects where we uh, went to the extreme and uh, we started building concepts of red zones where these are totally unmanned and and, and due to the uh, sour nature of these fields. So. High, high, high presence of H2S. You don't want to risk people to go into those zones. So the business, the the, 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 the operations itself forces you to move to and adapt to these new digital tools. And parallel, and besides, you know, working with these operations and developing these concepts, we are working on uh, launching the a new standard for the company, new digital standard that will be used for all uh, new projects. So the purpose of, of this new standard is to drive this consistently in all projects. So it's not anymore an initiative in a specific mm -hmm. project. It, we're setting a benchmark across our, all of these new, new projects. And as okay. I highlighted uh, that the Brownfield is a different game. Brownfield, you know, you need to work with, with your operations and, and, uh, and identify, you know, the opportunities. You need to work with them because you have the people already in the field. You, you, there are already certain set of practices ongoing. So to change these practices is not easy from day one. So, is 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 and and deploying you know a robot or deploying uh, any tool will not you know uh, transform your business. You need to work on a change management program, adaptation, uh, re-engineering of the processes. Uh, yeah. Make sure that the tool is delivering the intended uh, uh, benefits. And then slowly the business will transform with you to adapt to these okay. new techniques. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Khalid. Um, I mean, from, from, I think from what you're telling, I believe Atmog is really following a very holistic approach with a clear understanding that focusing on technology solution is just not enough to achieve the goals. Really, man, talking about topics like people, culture, processes play a very vital role in your transformation journey, which is again, just reflecting the importance yeah. of human-centric approach uh, for the future. To tell you the truth, um, uh, Dr. Oliver, we are learning in, in the journey. So as we yes. adapt, as we try different methodologies, you know, we, we find out that this methodology works, this engagement model works, and this one doesn't work. And what suits company X doesn't suit company Y within the, you know, promote this as we are moving. Very good. So, so, so since we're touching on people, culture, environment, sustainability, nature, Ahmed, over to you. Thank you, Dr. So, Oliver. So I think that from my understanding, the Red Sea project focuses on developing really international tourism destination, which aims to set new standards for sustainable development using technology and digital and smart, smart use cases kind of. First of all, could you share briefly some details on this very exciting project? Absolutely. Thanks for, first of all, thank you, Dr. Oliver, for hosting me in this panel. And uh, greetings and good afternoon to the esteemed panelists. Uh, 2021 marks our second year into the construction phase of uh, the Red Sea project, which aims at delivering a very unique international luxury tourism destination focused on sustainability and centered around regenerative, the concept of regenerative tourism. Now, what do we mean by this concept? 
it, it means that we are no longer settling with simply protecting and preserving the environment, but we aim to enhance the environment. Now, how do we make sure that we monitor and track uh, uh, the, the, the measurement of our progress in terms of enhancing our, uh, our environment, which, which by the way, we've, we've, uh, we've committed and we pledged to enhance uh, the natural uh, ecosystem and, and uh, by 30% over the next 20 years. So that's, that's a very important uh, commitment from the Red Sea and from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia to build a new relationship between tourism, the environment and, uh, and, and sustainability and technology uh, enabled uh, at the end of the day. So two years in the construction uh, and, and by, by going through a very exciting journey of multiple iterations. So first of all, we, we iterated multiple times our master plan through a marine spatial planning exercise, which means we had to understand and put a pri priority from a scientific perspective on the, on the, uh, to, the, to the biodiverse ecosystem that we have, meaning that we're only going to be developing on 22 out of 90 plus islands to make sure that the remainder of the islands uh, become uh, a, a conserve, conservation areas and the only 22 uh, islands we develop on uh, um, across the entire life cycle of the project. Now, when we construct on a very sensitive ecosystem, it means we have to adopt construction methods that are sustainable, utilizing uh, the prefabricated and modular construction made offsite. Uh, second, we make sure that we utilize green concrete manufactured on site. Uh, and third, and very importantly, we also make sure that our energy is produced as 100% renewable. We're going to be producing 100% renewable energy to power the, entire, the entirety of the development and the destination through solar power and wind power. And uh, by installing one of the biggest, biggest uh, battery storage facilities in the world to make sure that we have 365 days, 24 hour renewable energy. That's a solid commitment to sustainability. And this is a utilization of, of, of uh, the power uh, technologies. We don't harm the environment. Uh, on top of that, everything we're mentioning, whether it's during construction phase, doctor, or post operation, once we start uh, receiving our first guests, we're on track to receive our first guests, guests by the end of 2022. We are, we, we are building a, a highly integrative technology uh, platform. We call it smart destination, not a smart city because we are, we, we are a destination. And that data platform, smart data platform, will host uh, more than 52 services that cover smart tourism, meaning how do we ensure a seamless experience for the tourists and the guests and the residents and the workers. Uh, but equally important, uh, if not more, how do we make sure we monitor the progress of our environmental conservation and enhancement through the deployment of IoT devices across a very vast lagoon, uh, 90 plus lagoon, 2,400 square kilometers of water uh, to make sure we monitor and we prove uh, through the use of uh, consistent technologies that we're enhancing the, the, the environment. This is super exciting. So, uh, you, you kind of touched already on, on, a, on a topic which I was also very curious about. It's really this topic of how you're using technology and digitization and AI and, and you know, essentially really these, these core topics of, of, of what we're talking about, shaping society uh, 5.0. How do you really use these kind of technologies uh, in, in, in making a difference? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I'll start with one, one example of out of the 52 smart services, if I may, doctor. Uh, that example uh, really uh, translates our focus on the worker and employee welfare. So we are currently awarding a contract. We've awarded the contract to implement a technology, a wearable device technology uh, that, that, that works on, uh, based on wireless connectivity to cover one, our employees, uh, our workforce across almost 3,500 square kilometers of construction sites. Uh, we're, we're covering a number of 36,000 employees at peak uh, and our fleet of vehicles. Now, why, why do we do this? Well, it's simply to balance between an efficient construction process, yet at the same time, making sure that the workforce and the employees at site 
have a, an enhanced safety and security uh, uh, technology that would support them to, to make sure that, first of all, they're, they're located anywhere they are at site. So and if by any chance somebody needs a, a, a to, to send an SOS signal, they, these tags or wireless tags that work uh, on, 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 on LoRaWAN technology, so very low power, very uh, uh, high range uh, devices, they can press this panic button and somebody can intervene, whether for safety or for health, uh, if there is a health incident to intervene and make sure we avoid uh, losses and, and, and precious human life. At the same time, we have more than 3,000 vehicles coming in and out of our site. They belong to different contractors. They bring in employees, they bring in raw material, they bring in, uh, you know, equipment to our construction site. We want to make sure that access is controlled, access is monitored, and, and the flow is really seamless during construction. That is one out of 52 examples, which we are currently implementing. Uh, in the future, you'll be hearing more about how we make sure that the visitor experience is seamless. That's also mm -hmm. from a human perspective, but I wanted to focus more a little bit on, on reality, yeah. on actual progress, which is covering our workforce during the construction phase. I have to say, Ahmed, uh, every time uh, we talk, I'm, I'm really truly amazed by the progress you're, you're making in, in, in building this unique uh, destination. Uh, and, and really also how much emphasis you're giving to the integration into the local environment, really. And considering the, the nature and the people, I think this is, it, it's truly unique in, in many ways. Um, so now maybe let's move from a, a smart tourist destination in Saudi to a smart city in the UAE. Over to you, Nita. Yeah, thank you. Um, Nita, uh, I, I, I think from, from the many discussions we had in the past, um, the DH, so Dubai Holding, is, is really where innovation is really at the heart of, of your organization. And really to forge the way from a knowledge based society to a smart, inclusive, sustainable society. So, how does Dubai Holding really contribute to the Dubai's objectives to be the happiest city in the world? So thank you. Thank you, Oliver, for the question. And thank you to Khaled and Ahmed for some brilliant perspectives. I really enjoyed that, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, how do you contribute? How does Dubai Holding contribute? How do we as individuals contribute? You know, how do professionals contribute? My my yeah. my view is first and foremost through action, right? Through being in the arena, right? Not on the sidelines and getting stuff done, right? So, yeah. so Broadly, there are two vectors of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, what we are doing in Dubai Holding. One is the action, right, uh, on transformation, on innovation, on technology. And then the second is supporting the ecosystem, right, which is enabling uh, innovation and transformation, right? So it, let me cover this very briefly. I mean, in terms of the action, you know, first and foremost, uh, you need to create magical, memorable experiences for your customers, right? This passion for customer is critical to your transformation journey. And you should flip it around and say, not just customers, but also employees. I mean, the yin and yang, right? So customer experience, you know, passion and obsession for customers. Then, you know, you just can't have a digital veneer and action on the digital side, on the front frontline side, and keep your back office analogous, right? That yeah. doesn't work. Yeah, That doesn't give you true authentic transformation. So I think the second big action item is not automatic. back office office. Third is ways of working. We learned it during this pandemic. I mean, everybody went remote. We are all having a conversation remotely, right? Cloud, remote, ways of working, right? And then something that we are doing, Oliver, very closely with your team is this experimentation with new business models because transformation yeah. and action is not just about your existing business model, but also about these new, you know, experimentation, looking, sensing, responding. And then if you find something, you know, investing and scaling, right? And finally, I think in terms of action, you know, also building these strategic capabilities, right? Which will you know, stand the test of time. Cybersecurity, I mean, you can't run digital without cybersecurity, people, training, somebody mentioned digitally, right? This passion for them. Mm -hmm. On the front, this is what we are doing. And then on the on the support front, you know, I feel the startup ecosystem where disruption happens, 
there's a symbiotic relationship between enterprises and startups, right? So we are perpetually inviting startups to come into our environment, intersect with our businesses. So that, that's something we do formally and informally. And then of course, you know, by holding, I mean, well before my time here, the leaders here are brilliant. They've set up things like in five DD. So they're institutional means as well. Uh, yep. that, right? So these are some of the ways in which uh, we are kind of uh, trying to deliver the promise of digital. This is, this is super, super exciting. I think it's, it's really leading, really leading the, the development here in, in, in the UAE. So, so in, in that context, maybe, so, so, so how do you see that citizens, visitors, um, and other companies can really, to a wider extent, participate in, in, in these developments? How do you see that? Yeah, yeah I, think, I think, you know, one is uh, through this uh, kind of building these experiences, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, when citizens intersect with these experiences, that, you know, that creates memorable experiences. And I think that is one component of how do you get citizens involved with the journey, right? I mean, create meaningful experiences, deploy them, get citizens to adopt, and they'll enjoy it. And, you know, it will create some memories in their in the systems. Right? But also, okay. if I focus a bit, you know, on the other aspect, younger generation, I mean, my daughter, you know, my, I'm sure all of yours, right? These guys, I mean, they're, they're looking for meaning, they're looking for purpose, sustainability, the future, right? I mean, it's amazing the number of times the kids will grill you about the purpose and the meaning and, you know, all the good things. Ahmed spoke about sustainability, right? It's quite amazing how the world has changed, actually, yeah, especially in the young generation. So I think, you know, Dubai Holdings, I mean, it's very essence is uh, for the good of tomorrow. So we are perpetually future focused, looking at innovation, right? Uh, you know, equality is core. I mean, if my chief marketing officer was here and my chief, uh, you know, human resource officer and our executive CEO was here, he would spend a lot of time on, you know, talking about equality per se, right? And then of course, you know, sustainability, you've seen a lot of examples, the recent one on waste management that we've invested in, right? So a lot of investment and, you know, uh, investment yeah. and, you know, focus on sustainability as well. So perhaps yeah. these are the ways creating experiences and then giving importance to what is important to the youngsters, right? Okay. Yeah, so, so and, and then maybe this, the, the third angle you were uh, touching on briefly already is this, this, this side of your employees kind of, right? I mean, if I recall correctly, you have more than 20,000 or around about 20,000 employees uh, plus and in so many industries, uh, DH is kind of involved in. And I can imagine that digitization is, is really creating a major impact in in improving the operation, being more successful, more competitive, and and and. So maybe you can uh, share a few more insights, uh, particularly in that direction, how you see that uh, working out. Yeah, you know, it's just, uh, I've spent 22, 23 years uh, with, uh, as you know, the Emirates Group, and then last two, three years with Dubai Holding, and I'm just quite lucky to be part of forward-looking organizations, right, who recognize that you can't do digital or transformation or change by not focusing on the employees, right? I mean, it's it's critical. I mean, I cannot say it enough, right? Yeah. So what have we done? I mean, we've taken a few innovative approaches. Oliver, you know, you know a few of them. I mean, yeah. sometimes what happens is you concentrate on the customer, which you should. You create some beautiful digital experiences, right? Uh, which which we have done as well. I mean, if you look at the Jumeirah digital experience or the new yeah. thing, right? so you do that, right? But then, you know, you forget about the employees, right? And the employees get some, you know, fairly ordinary, mediocre digital experiences. And we shifted that, right? I mean, we invested in a platform called One. We call it One because it ties our 20,000 employees across all verticals, right? And, you know, it's, it's a platform which we have created ourselves. You know, the marketing for the platform was very innovative. It was done by the in-house team. So it's, a, it's a, like a two-sided marketplace for our employees, right? Employees contribute. Our products are there, our services are there. You can buy a Jumeirah uh, hotel. I mean, you can stay at a Jumeirah hotel, you buy grocery on one. So, you know, one is platform, right? Creating a same, I mean, giving the same importance to employee digital experience as you would to your uh, customers, right? Second is creation. You don't do anything alone nowadays. I mean, you just cannot do it, right? Yeah, it's all about ecosystem approaches, you know, working yeah. with great partners like yourself, working with CHRO, working with staff, working with marketing. You know, getting a lot of co-creative activity going in the creation of this platform, right? Yeah. And then some very interesting. We run a program uh, called Co-Engage, 
uh, which are uh, human resource and marketing does together. You know where you know nowadays. I mean, earlier it used to be about uh, let me learn a lot to know, right? Let me try and know everything, right? Yeah, but it's completely flipped. Today, you know, you need to know how to learn. Perpetual curiosity, right? So this learning environment is what we call co-engage, and then having a lot of fun on the way, right? So I think employees are crucially important. You got to do multiple things, and this is what we are doing, right? In our in our transformation plan. Thank you so much, Ethan. Um, I can just repeat that I think DH is really a, a great case in point of, of let's say that the scope and the scale of technology adoption has not only been rapidly expanding in recent years, but also how it has really moved to the top of the agenda of the entire organization. I think this is a fantastic, really a, a showcase of, of, of this, this transition successfully. So last but not least again, uh, now it would be very interesting to hear from you, Abdullah, how a company with such a long and proud history like Zubair is continuously reinventing itself and how do you address the various challenges we are actually talking about today? Um, so, so from my knowledge, this Zubair Corporation has been integrating technology and expertise from around the world for over five decades, probably now, in the Sultanate of Oman. Does making it really truly one of the leading private conglomerates in the region. So what do you think are the key pillars of the digitization strategy Zubair is built on? Well, uh, first, thank you very much for inviting me to this rather very interesting uh, gathering. I quite enjoy listening to my friends uh, Khalid, Ahmed, and Ahan, uh, and about what they have been doing. And I hope I meet your expectation by, by being just as interesting as they have been. I'm, uh, I'm very sure. Uh, obviously, uh, Al Zubair uh, Corporation uh, is one of the longest uh, established uh, business conglomerate in, uh, in Oman. Uh, started its business back in 1969. And through a uh, very uh, uh, leader, uh, Mr. Uh, His Excellency Mohammed Al Zubair, who himself was one of the leading uh, businessmen, but as well as a leading government uh, person, he himself held uh, some very top uh, uh, portfolios in the government. And uh, for a long time, he was the advisor of the previous uh, Sultan, His Majesty Sultan Qabus, to build this uh, business. Obviously, the la business landscape at that time in Oman demanded uh, a different style of uh, business, different style of management. And the focus was mostly on building the infrastructure of the country. Obviously, uh, you realize that all, most of the GCC countries went through similar experiences after the discoveries of the oil and the uh, nation building. Uh, obviously, Oman was one of the last country to join, maybe Oman and the United Arab Emirates, almost in around 1970. And, uh, and that where there was the opportunity, but and also the responsibility by those business leaders to work hand in hand with the government to build the nation. And uh, there were only a few uh, business uh, corporations who were able to meet such challenges. Uh, like uh, Zubair Group, Zawawi Group, uh, Bahwan Group, and, and the others. So, five decades after that, uh, we inherited quite uh, a challenge. One of the challenges, uh, both the government and society look at you as part of the government, whether we like it or not, because we were extended part of the economy. So you have a lot of social responsibility in that sense. Uh, you have a depend almost entirely on your leadership for their day to day, year to year there. And uh, we are now into almost coming to the third generation of people who are joining us from father to grandfather working for the same corporation. On the other oh. hand, so you have uh, responsibility, social responsibility from the social side, as well as the, from the government responsibility where the government uh, have recently initiated is the Oman Vision 2040, and they expect the cooperation to play a, more, a major role into helping the government to achieve its goals by 2040. And those goals are very wide reaching, and I'm sure somebody go to Oman website, to Oman Vision 2040, you will find those goals. 
both it is a challenge, but it's also for us an, uh, an opportunity, obviously, to be to play part of that. And there is a lot of focus in this uh, in this uh, vision is on the human side. Uh, Fifty, you know, when in the early say eighties, nineties, where we relied uh, heavily on uh, expatriate workforce, as mm -hmm. the number of young Omani graduated from colleges and high schools and technical colleges increasingly uh, grow by numbers and also to be to participate in this uh, in the business environment, uh, we have the responsibility to take care of that and help the government into identifying those people, helping those people, training those people, developing those people and and uh, with the aim is to have them eventually part to be part of our business. The other uh, thing challenge we face is uh, as we built our uh, as uh, Zubair built its uh, businesses, uh, tenant, uh, which was built mixed of uh, green fields, joint ventures, acquiring companies, uh, merging with other companies. We inherited a lot of complex systems, both in legal complexity mm -hmm. as well as technical complexity. So mm -hmm. it was a good thing to 50 years down the road to stop and look at yourself and you know. For that business and in our area, it's almost like you're coming, becoming very old, and basically looking at ways how you can re-energize re yourself so you hopefully move to the next 50 years uh, with the and meeting both your own goals, the society goals, and the government goals, and as well as your own employees' goals. So one of the major things we found is with the new generation, they call them uh, Generation Z, is there ability and their ease of how dealing with technology, especially yeah. the mobile technology with the digital technology. So they were both opportunity, but also a challenge because the way we were doing our business, it was really, there was a big gap between their aspiration and their way of doing things and between what we have been doing because we were up until now dealing directly with the government in most of the major infrastructure projects. So we didn't even have to have any of this kind of uh, technologies and tools in hand. However, from as the as you know that especially with the COVID, we have seen majority of people have started moving to online, moving to the social media, moving to mobile computing, and this poses uh, posed both a business challenge as well as a social challenge for us. Mm -hmm. So we we conducted back in 19, uh, 2000 and what we call an operational review assessment of where we are as a, and based on that one, we have launched this digital transformation uh, strategy that hopefully uh, give us uh, the right indications and the right target and the right goals, what we need to achieve in the medium, sh uh, short, medium and long term. And for that, we have uh, entrusted uh, Siemens to be our partner to help us in, uh, in this uh, assessment. And uh, we are almost 50% uh, down the road. In fact, just uh, about uh, a week ago, we finished our uh, as is assessment. And we're looking forward in the second part where we will be sitting together with our partners and uh, basically drawing the roadmap for us for the future. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, uh, as uh, all your speakers said, it is easy to get lost into digital and the physical world when you're dealing with this thing. But as uh, all of them have repeated, it is the human element. So we have the physical, the human, and the dig digital element. The, it is the human element which is normally create the biggest challenge, but also create the biggest opportunity. Because at the end of the day, they will be the people, your employees, your staff, who will be sitting behind those physical and digital equipment and actually creating the real business for us. Mm -hmm. So we are we look for, we're looking forward uh, to this uh, exciting journey to create our own Zubair ecosystem, where we will have all our uh, business units under this uh, esteemed uh, corporation to be working on a as much as possible on a single uh, electronic and digital platform which will provide the uh, foundation for all our 
employees to innovate, to excel, to shine, and to come up with those great ideas that we will be hopefully achieve to them, to ourselves, and to participate in the bigger picture with the government in achieving Oman Vision 24. So, 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 so maybe we had talked a lot about um, to bear on, on, on the one hand, and you were also briefly touching on, on really on, on, on the country itself. So, I mean, considering your very impressive career in the country, you know, in the very many different positions you have had, what do you think is actually, what do you see is the main challenge for the Sultanate? Sultanate. So for Oman as a nation to really unlock the digital future. Actually, we were lucky in Oman about uh, in 2000 and uh, in about 2013, uh, the government have launched uh, a strategy. We call it uh, Oman Digital Oman Digital Society Strategy, and uh, the short term for that one is E Oman Strategy, and it set mm -hmm. some very good uh, target. This was purely initiated by the government. It didn't come from the private sector, which is, again, I found this is very uh, far-sighted. And uh, the late His Majesty made a speech in the Al-Shura Council, it is our parliament. And in his speech, he mentioned that he would like to see that we have uh, a digital uh, society where people use knowledge to create good rather than depending on the physical side. And so, and uh, then uh, we had uh, the uh, ITA, uh, uh, Information Technology uh, Authority, have uh, taken that uh, strategy and created many objectives and goals. And the major part of that was is to uh, increase the delivery integration and the quality of the electronic government services and to mm -hmm. drive the adoption by the citizens and residents and the business. That was one. The other one was is to increase the comp competency of the Omani IT manpower. So to build that competency and to enable growing Omani IT businesses, particularly the small and medium sized enterprises and to create more uh, future jobs. Yeah. And the third one was is to drive the digital literacy and literally the ITA went around and gave free laptops to the families and training for people to start using the uh, using laptops and the internet because this was in Oman was at the beginning of the uh, internet and mobile computing. So basically the government created a program to for those people who cannot afford it. And the government have also instituted legal part where the service providers were by law were ordered to provide internet connectivity across the whole Oman. And if you know that Oman is, Oman is geographically a killer. You know, we have very high mountain, we have very deep valleys, we have big desert, and we have so many small villages spread across the whole country. It will make absolutely no business and commercial sense to put even a telephone line there, let alone putting a broadband to those areas. However, the government have didn't want to leave anybody behind and forced the service provider, the telecom, to provide that connectivity to all the schools, all the hospitals, and all the villages across Oman. So that, and that from there, it has shown that the government was really seriously uh, committed toward uh, building the digital society mm -hmm. and the knowledge society on top of that. That okay. it made it very easy for us as businesses to jump on the wagon and continue. Yes, okay. It created a responsibility on us to work with the government to achieve the government goals. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abdullah. Um, uh, it's really a, a quite exciting journey you have been part of for, for, for a very long time, uh, not only for Zobea, but also really for, for the better of the, of the Omani nation. Um, I think we are unfortunately running out of time. I would love to continue this discussion. Uh, it's, it's super exciting to hear from all of you. Um, and it's really impressive of, of you know, the contribution you and all of your companies are doing to the, to the Middle East societies. Um, so therefore, I would like, really like to thank all of you for your time today uh, and for this interesting discussion.
I, I have to say, I'm personally very excited to see how the Middle East region will transform more and more within this human-centered technology-based society in the years and decades to come. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that together we can foster innovation, which will not only create economic value, but also really create a future for, for us and for our children uh, with room for dreams. Um, thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Oliver. Thank you very much for hosting us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.